the largest crowd, I think we had 3,500 people there. And Congressman Conley, I finally decided in 2000, after 17 years, that it was time for me to, to give it up because I did it for 17 years. And it was, it was a huge undertaking because the choir would rehearse in December, so it pretty much we gave up Christmas holidays in my house. And it was just, we thought, okay, it's time for you to quit. And I got this call from someone from Dr. Con Senator, Con I mean, Congressman Conley's office, and he wanted to attend. And they said, you're not running the contest, but we heard that you could help us. And so I did. And then when I ran for the school board here recently, I said, I remember somebody from Congressman Conley's office calling me. And he said, um, that would be me, Colin Davenport. And I had never met him before. And it was him. It was just interesting how everything really came together. But our kids went on, and I brought some newspaper clippings of that. Um, two of the kids went to the White House to speak. So we had kids that went to the White House. Uh, one of the, one of the um, speakers, there are kids now who have um, doctorates. Um, one, uh, the, the, one of the students is a, a physician, a pediatrician, uh, lawyers. Uh, they've gone on to do really great things. And to watch what happens when you have high expectation, you believe that kids can do it. They could not only recite a speech, then they started to say things like, um, we, we could write our own speech. So I would just wait, and, and the theme would always come. And so we, we did one theme where it was by the content of their character. You give them the theme, and they would just write a speech. Uh, I had another theme was, let's meet at the table of brotherhood. Get that? Um, Malcolm and Martin, um, Two Roads to Freedom. Um, I did one on Birmingham, Birmingham to Tuskegee, because um, Booker T was also an orator, and at age 16, like Martin Luther King, went to college. And when I studied strict, uh, Tuskegee, because of this whole oral tradition of who we are, you know, the keeper of the keeper of the information, um, that was part of those African American schools. And uh, my husband's cousin, that we finally found his family who. He's from a mixed background also, found his family, and I found the report card. He had his PhD, um, his cousin was 100, her husband had his PhD, Wilberforce University. I found his report card, and in that report card there was recitation. And at Tuskegee, there was a recitation room. It was, you had to learn speeches, and that was a part of your grade. It all came from that oral tradition. So we've always been able to keep that information in our heads. And so you go to the strengths of what people bring to the table instead of saying you do one thing. But the kids, getting back to the kids, the kids not only could write a speech, about five years into MLK, I was sitting on stage, and there were about 2,500 people out there. And I looked over, and none of the kids had their note cards. <laughs> and I whispered, where are your note cards? And they said, Miss Jesse, we don't need our note cards. <laughs> and I said, what? You don't need your note cards? No. And from that day on until now, when you watch MLK in Prince William County, rarely do they use their note cards. If you use your note cards, you, you generally will not win. It was just this whole, you open the door and this intellectual power comes in. And so when, what's still here today is this uh, belief that one researcher, her name is Carol Dweck, calls the fixed intelligence, the fixed mindset. Uh, you have to believe that some people still believe that intelligence is fixed and that some groups of kids don't have that intellectual ability. Uh, and what Carol Dweck's research shows, which I've always known, just didn't know what it was, that there's this fluid, uh, malleable intellectual power that we have. And it's just waiting for somebody to come in there and, and open it up. So once, once I open the door, 
these kids, well, well, well we don't want to recite anymore. We, we had to kick recitation. We can write our own speeches, and they did. Uh, we cannot, we can, without no, no cards, and you'll see them. They'll walk off the stage into the audience and still speaking, and they'll do the swagger. They get the, 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 the there is a difference in the way African American kids speak and talk. It's a part of who we are. And, and so what you do, you learn to embrace where you come from. And when you embrace where you come from, I think everything just works. And, and I found that with kids. So when I was at Vaughn, we, we had pep rallies, we had dances, we had um, the J curve, which is like you, you can be on the other end of the bell curve. And so they came up with something they call the J curve shuffle. And they would like, we're going move, to move to 600. We're going to get a perfect score. And we had 600 clubs. We had 500 clubs. Um, the kids have... Um, the names engraved in brick over there. If you go over there, there's a big walkway. I've had it since 1991, 92 as principal. And if you had straight A, you got your name engraved in brick. Oh yeah, it's out there. And um, high expectations for kids. You have to work on it. You work on it all the time because for from 1991 until about two years before I left. I had about 34, we call them brick kids, because they named themselves the brick kids, and they would say, we're going for the brick. You start with your name engraved, and if you're straight A, you got a plaque, and you would to put a little star every time you got a straight A. If you got four, you got you, you had the brick. And so the brick kids uh, would say, they would set a goal. I'm going to go for the brick. I'm going for the brick. And so about three years before I retired, I decided, I'm going to talk to these kids. And I brought them in and put them in, in the auditorium, and I said, well, how many of you have a goal? And they said, yeah, we have a goal. We're going to be brick kids. If they got straight A for the first nine weeks, so you're going to go for the brick, right? Yes, we're going for the brick. Um, well, um, how are you going to get there? And they would say, well, well we're going to study. We're going to, we're going to, and then finally I asked the question, well, what are your grades now? And they would say, um, we don't know. Like, how are you going to set a goal if you don't even know what your grades are now? And, and the, you go back and talk to your teachers and tell them you want to be a brick kid and see what your grades are now. And if you have a B plus, ask the teacher if there's some extra work or something you can do to bring the grade up. If there's some way you can bring your grade up. And they went back and did that. And so we went from 34 to 62 brick kids amazing so I said are these real I you know I, and so I, I told the teachers I said if these kids are straight A when when their test scores come back they should all be 500 which is past advanced on the SOL or 600 and they were so the next year I decided I'm gonna bring them in have a conversation with them and I'm gonna have them go back to their teachers but I'm going to bring them back to me to make sure they actually talk to the teachers. So I said, I'm going to bring you back. So you, when I say go talk to your teachers, I want you to, and I'm going to check on it. Brought them all back and said, okay, what's your teacher say? Every kid but one said, one teacher said, I've got a B plus and that's it. And there's nothing can be done about it. And as it turned out, it was one of those subjective grades. And I talked to the teacher and I said, well, do you think this kid is really a straight A kid? Well, yeah. Well, it was subjective and, you know, and, you know, and uh, so we were able to fix that, not give him something, but something that he really deserved. We went from 62 kids to 114 straight-A kids. That's remarkable. And we had to expand the walkway. Oh, my goodness. Um, and, I, and, I, and so for me, it was so six weeks before SOLs, we had another strategy, which was if we would simulate the test with all the kids in the building. And when you simulate it, of course, you got everything going. And we treated it like it was a football thing, you know. SOLs are coming. We had pep rallies. We had signs up. We had rah, 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 and da, 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 da. It's coming. It's coming. You've been working all year for this, right? So we got to make it real. And so we were just working on this thing and making sure. So the deal was if you failed the simulation six weeks out, you had to meet with the principal. And 
her crew. Because what I would do, I had um, Rachel English, who was my assistant principal. Rachel and I became the first African-American duo, principal, assistant principal, in Prince William County. Because up until, up in the 90s, they had never had two people, two African-Americans together. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Very and and interesting. we, and they had to come down and look at all, all the parents that had input, you know. Anyway, she retired and she came down and my guidance counselor, any specialist in the building, and we would go into this, uh, this room that we called the high expectation room. You know, because everything was, everything was about high expectation. You know, I'm going to go to the high ex room, uh, you're a brick kid. You can do it. You're smart. Uh, all the kids were called the bright ones, and they start to believe it, and people become what you tell them. Mm -hmm. I believe that, and it's true. So they would come in that room, and, and I would go to a question, each one of us, and say, oh. and the, you, you'd ask a simple question, like, what happened? I said, well, they would look at the question and would say, um, did I put C? That's really B. It should be B, Miss Jessie. Or, oh, I, I misunderstood this for that. And so each one of us saw 25 kids. And so at the end of the conversation, I said to Rachel, it's back to my dad's kind of thinking, um, how many of your kids couldn't and how many didn't? So she said, what? I said, I, I had a bunch of kids who just didn't, who could, but they didn't. 